We have several uh, books which inform us about the Supreme Lord's pastimes on the earth. These three books are Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, and a book called, called Harivamsa, which is a very authoritative book accepted by the Vaishnavas. Uh, Harivamsa means the family of Harivamsa. Mahabharata, you know, Mahabharata, the great history of Bharat, and Srimad Bhagavatam. So, <clears throat> it is only in Srimad Bhagavatam that we find Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes. There, there are no pastimes of Krishna at Vrindavan mentioned in Mahabharata, only in Srimad Bhagavatam. Uh, some years ago, when Mahabharata was showing in India, you know, when they made that long mm. they just simply injected some Vrindavan pastimes, some uh, color throwing, holy. And the sadhu section, they protested, what is this? What is this? There is no Krishna Leela of Vrindavan type uh, in Mahabharata. This is a concoction. Uh, and similarly, uh, in, in this Harivamsa, uh, there, is, there, there may be some mention that Krishna was from Vrindavan, that he lived in Vrindavan, and so forth. But there is no mention, no description of his pastimes. So, in Srimad Bhagavatam is where Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes are presented in the tenth canto of Bhagavatam. So, I selected one verse here this, uh, this evening uh, to read and have some discussion on uh, because in the purport it contains one particular very interesting point, which will lead to some nice, some nice discussion about Krishna's pastimes. So this is from the 10th canto, the 9th chapter, which is entitled, Mother <coughs> Soda Binds Lord Krishna. Now generally, binding Lord Krishna, this is related to what time of year? Kartik, generally. How Krishna is bound by the ropes of Mother Soda. And thus he is known as Damodar, and that month, Damodar. So it is also appropriate any time Krishna's pastimes, not that only Damodar Lila is read in Damodar month, and only Krishna's appearance is read on Jatmastami. Uh, not like that. And Krishna's pastimes are eternally going on. All of his pastimes are being manifested simultaneously somewhere. The, the most unique thing within our capacity to imagine, and we must use, to some extent, just try to imagine. Mm -hmm. Because when we say just try to imagine, imagine means we have to go beyond the norm. Mm -hmm. Just think. Just imagine. And in this way, we try to go. Uh, so we must approach in that way, just imagine because it is beyond our norm. 
Yet, Krishna is not within the scope of our imagination. He is not subject to come within the scope of our imagination. But just imagine means we must be prepared that what we will experience uh, in Krishna, it is beyond our normal understanding. It is beyond even the paranormal. So, who's in the past times of Krishna? All are eternal. But what, what understanding do we have of eternal? Eternal, we have a rather limited understanding. We have this idea, without ending. But ending in itself is a limitation. But we say without end, like a rope that had no end. It just goes and goes and goes. But still, the word end is there. So eternal, it may mean, we may say, without ending. But it is even more than that. No conception of ending. And saying without ending, we're attaching some possibility of ending. That which is even beyond the conception of that. Always manifest. So all Krishna's pastimes, they are eternally manifest. Uh, except for Four of his pastimes are only occasionally manifest. When the Supreme Lord advents to any particular universe, his very advent, that is not eternal. Well, from another side, it is discussed that yes, it is eternal. Goloka and Gokula. Goloka is the unmanifest, where everything is going on eternally. And Gokula is where that unmanifest becomes manifest. Well, ultimately, both are eternal. Yet, in the eternal Goloka Vrindavan, Krishna does not take birth. He does not appear there. Similarly, he does not disappear there. And we do not observe the disappearance. Lord Krishna, although it is mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam about his disappearance from the world, no date is set to observe that. Uh, so, uh, in this world, the Lord appears and he shows his pastime of disappearance. But in Goloka, he neither appears nor does he ever disappear. Also, the Lord kills demons this world. But he kills no demons in Goloka. In Goloka there are no demons to kill. Gokula is where Goloka touches the earth. On earthly side there are demons. So there is some capacity for overlapping there. There Krishna kills demons. Krishna kills demons. But there in Goloka there are no demons. So there is no slaying of demons. And also, there, in Goloka Vrindavan, there are no husbands of the gopis, other than the Vatsalya Ras. Vatsalya Ras means the elders, like Vodhisattva Maharaj, Purnamasi, and others, Jatila. They're elderly, and they're elderly gentlemen there. Nanda Maharaj, Nanda Maharaj's brother, an extended family is there, the family elderly section of Vatsalya Ras. But in the younger section, in the, in the Madhurya section, there are no husbands there. Only here, in this world, are there so-called husbands, the gopis. In particular, we were discussing earlier, Maharaj and I were discussing, Abhimanu. Who is this Abhimanu? Who is Abhimanu? He plays the husband of Sri so if you contemplate that, this becomes an impossibility. Who? Who will play? There is no husband. If any husband, that is Madhava. Madhava means the husband of the goddess of fortune. So Madhava is actually the husband of Radharani. Radharani is the supreme goddess of fortune. 
But here in this world, there are some husbands of the goats. So who is this Abhimanu? Who will be? Who will play the part of the husband of God? Who can do that? No one can do that. We try to analyze who can do that. Sometimes for certain necessity, the Lord expands himself. The Lord himself, Krishna, he cannot, will not expand himself as Abhimanu to play the husband of Radharani. This will spoil the whole thing. So that's not possible. So for many such things, Baladev expands himself. But how will Baladev, who won't even look into the face of Radharani, if he sees her footprint someplace, he goes in the opposite direction, that there should not be even a chance meeting. How will that Baladev expand himself, and how will he become the husband? This is also not possible. So who will become within what jiva, what unfortunate, unfortunate jiva soul could be assigned that service? Better to to be Chotahari does thousands of times, millions of times. The example of Chotahari does, he's pure devotee of the Lord. The Lord chose him to show one special example for the sannyasis, particularly gave an example of Chodhari Das. So we might think, oh, that's such a hard service to, to show for the Lord. You know, to give up his own life, reject it, and all these things. Well, that may be acceptable. What jiva will accept the role of Adhima? I mean, that would be a curse, wouldn't it? What a curse. The conclusion is, this Abhimanu is a figment of someone's imagination. He doesn't even exist. Figment of the imagination, more or less. He's not any jiva soul, not any expansion of Baladev, not any expansion of Krishna. Figment of the imagination means Yogamaya. By Yogamaya arrangement, Abhimanu, the husband of Radharani. Otherwise, no one can be husband of Radharani. No one would want to play that role. Like Chandravali. Chandravali is competition. But what competition is there? Who is Chandravali? Any living entity will come to compete with Srimati Radharani? No. No one would want to accept that. No one will take that role. Oh yes, I will come as your competitor. In Sakyaras, and even in Vatsalyaras, there may be some competition. And other devotees may give competition in different different ways. But that is that is acceptable just due to their nature of Vatsalya or to the, by the nature of Sakiras. But in Manduria, this is not possible. Who will give competition to Radharani? Again, no one will give competition. First is no one is fit to compete. And who will take up that? So, oh yes, just for the flavor of the rasa, I will give the competition. No one will do that either. Therefore, she herself becomes Chandravali. Chandravali is Radharani's own expansion. If the devotees hear there is competition to Radharani, actually they become very disturbed by that. How is this possible? Who will come to challenge our Lord? Hearing that in this world, the sadhaks, the devotees, they are disturbed by that. that there is some element to challenge the supremacy of our God. It is intolerable for them. Just like you read how that one Ram Bhakta, he just chanced to read, Ravana took away Sita. And this, this, this was like a hurricane or an earthquake in his heart. How is it possible the vile demon, Ravana, that he is touched by the most worshipable mother, Sita? He was Ram Bhakta. Intolerable. He could not tolerate the sound entered his ear, and it was an earthquake in his heart. He decided just to leave his body and die. He couldn't see anywhere to go, anywhere to run. Death seemed to be the only answer. So he was just stopped eating. At that time, Mahaprabhu arrived at his house. And he noticed the Brahmins not taking Prashad. Even after Mahaprabhu was served, the Brahmin did not take his meal. So Mahaprabhu inquired, why are you not taking your food? Why are you not taking Prashad? Then he revealed his heart. Oh, I have heard this, and I cannot live with this. I, I cannot remain in the, I cannot. The ears that have heard this, they should die. 
I should go away from this place. So who can feel like that? Only who has developed deep, deep affection, attachment, and love for the Supreme Lord in any particular incarnation. In this case, the Rama. He had such love for Ram, such love for Sita. He could not tolerate the hero. Similarly, such devotees in relation, in an even higher way, to Radha and Krishna. <clears throat> they cannot tolerate the hero. There is some competitor who will come to give competition to Srimati Radha. This is intolerable. We find in one place Bhakti Vinod Thakur writes, I do not want to even hear the name of that so-called competitor. He turns his head and deafens his ear. Don't tell me. I don't want to hear the name of that one. So-called. Huh? Just the name of such a person will tremble in his heart, will give some painful excitement to his heart. So to appease the devotees, Rupa Goswami in one book called uh, Radha Krishna Gaudadesh he has revealed there the identity of Srimati Radharani to appease the hearts of the devotees. No, sorry, uh, 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 Srimati Chandra He has appeased the hearts of the devotees. And there he has revealed that she herself is an expansion. Chandra is expansion of Radharani. So rest assured, my dear devotees, there is no competitor to our goddess. And then the devotees are very happy. No competitor. Yes. This is very so, nonetheless, the devotees will be seen from time to time to fall into their deep mood of devotion, and then they will feel that. They will feel some caution as regards Chandravali, for example, as Bhaktivinoda. It's not that he had never read that or didn't know that. That is called the Tustavichar. It's like balancing the scales. But we're not into balancing. We're for everything on one side and going downwards. Uh, everything to the side of Radharani, everything to her camp and going within that. So that's called bhava. The devotees bhava. But sometimes this the Tastavichara has to come and rescue the devotee. So Mahabharu, he had gone on, and the next place he stopped in South India, he found from some Purana, it was being read in the temple that the real Mother Sita, she went to uh, the ashram of, uh, I think, Agni, the fire, God of the fire, and that one Maya Sita was captured by this Ravana, and that actually Ravana, he never even saw Sita. He does not even have a qualified eye to see the beauty of Sita, but to speak of, capture her, take her pull her onto his chariot. So Mahaprabhu had that two, three leaves copy of this Purana, and he returned, and he gave the Brahman, and showed him. The Brahman got back his life. So this, this Tatastavichar like that, sometimes it comes to rescue the deep emotion of the devotee. Raghunath Das Goswami, initially, how he came to Govardhan Hill? To do puja? No, to suicide. Originally, he came to Govardhan Hill, there in Vrindavan, to give up his life. Yeah, he was already worshipping Govardhan Shiva, which Mahaprabhu gave him during his time. But after his disappearance, Raghunath passed many days in Jagannath Puri, and eventually he came to the conclusion that he cannot go on in life. Because not only Mahaprabhu left the world, after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu left the world, then one by one by one, very, very quickly, all his devotees, they all started to go. And suddenly they just all were leaving the world. But Raghunath couldn't leave the world. So at a particular point, <clears throat> he decided, I, I will go to Vrindavan, and from there I will jump from Govardhan Hill, and there I will die. Well, you can see, this is definitely just a feeling. Because you have to jump a hundred times from Govardhan Hill. <laughs> Still you won't die. <laughs> How you'll die from jumping from Govardhan Hill. And plus, you can't even go on top of Govardhan Hill. So, but that was his sentiment. I will go to Govardhan there. I should die. I should jump from Govardhan Hill. So he wasn't just thinking in some charming, poetic way. Actually, that was his feeling. 
I will go to glory down hill, jump from there, and I'll die there. Finish my life there. So when he went there, then came relief. Relief relief work came to him in the form of Rupa and Sanatana. And he found that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu lives in Rupa Sanatana. So then he got back his will to live. He got back his will to live. And he remained always in the company of Rupa and Sanatana. Again, later in his life, Many things manifest in Raghunath Goswami, which, which has heralded him, heralded him as our Prayojana Acharya. It means those feelings, highest feelings of devotion uh, to Radha and Krishna had manifest and became visible in Raghunath Goswami. Particularly his deep emotion towards Srimati Radharani and her divine service. So, one particular time, excuse me, he was Staying at Radhakund, I don't know if you've heard this story, this past time or not, but Raghunath Das Goswami was staying at Radhakund. And he was in his old age. And in his old age, his eye, eyesight had almost all but withdrawn. He did not see very much. <clears throat> so, um, the one a servant, one servant was assigned to him, and looking after his daily necessity which in terms of Raghunath Das Goswami was a minimal affair, his daily necessity. It consisted of a uh, bath, a little water, one cup, they say, and some curds and whey, some yogurt, and one cup, one patal. It's called a patal, one cup. So one day, there's a village nearby, and, and it's in that area, very nearby. So the servant happened to be there on some business or something, and he saw some very nice, very nice patals were available there for a few bites. So maybe he begged them even, oh, I'm doing service for my master, my guru, please give some cups. So they gave some cups, and he returned. Then that next day, he served Raghunath Das Goswami his patal, one portion of prasham. So shortly after, Raghunath Das became very sick, and he started to burn a fever. So the devotees became very fearful, and they brought one Kaviraj, a doctor, to ascertain any disease and give any appropriate medicine. So the Kaviraj was in the of mild things, simply suffering from overeating. And everybody thought, overeating? Das Goswami, overeating? He lives on one palm full of food in a day. How is overeating? And, and Raghunath Das Goswami, as uh, we were told, he said, uh, that is also a strange thing because I only took my standard patal. Mm -hmm. Same amount I take every day. So then that servant said, oh, uh, but this time that patal actually was a bigger quantity because that was a bigger bigger leaves. Then at that time, Raghunath Das became a little suspicious, and he queried, but at Radhakund, the patals are always the same. We are living here for so many years, daily we are using this patal, and they're always the same. So where did you get that patal, that cup? <clears throat> then that servant said, well, actually it isn't from Radhakund. I got that when I was passing through Shakistali, it's called, the village is Shakistali. Raghunath Das became a little mortified, and he said, that is the village of Chandramali. We will not take any of it from there. Return those cups immediately. So he sent that person back, and those cups there, and come back to Radhakur. So. In his devotion for Radharani, he doesn't even want to take a leaf cup from that place. But he also knows, he also knows, if he comes out of his mood, then he knows, oh, Radharani, this uh, Chandravali is actually an expansion of uh, our goddess. No, no difficulty here. But that is not the plane where the devotees remain. Actually, that is of two types. One, it may give some heart relief to them in some 
great uh, moment of need. And two, it will help us, the aspiring devotees, to know what is what. Otherwise, we will mix with so much Aparat. Because we don't have the bottle, then we may feel some some mundane contempt towards Shakyamali or Abhimanu or any of these personalities. Of course, then on the other side, we may not ever even think about it or know anything about it. And this it is called the Tastavichara. That is to give some balance in our understanding, both in the beginning and in the advanced stage of Krishna. Our Sri Sridhar Maharaj, he spoke much from this point to Tastavichar, explaining um, the nature of divine pastimes and things like this, and getting that sort of balance. So, the point of this particular verse um, is verse 21. Naya Sukhapo Bhagavan Dehinam Gopika Sutta Jnaninam Chatma Bhutanam Yata Bhakti Bhaktimatma Eha. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, the son of Mother Yasoda, is accessible to devotees engaged in spontaneous loving service. But he is not easily accessible to mental speculators, to those striving for self realization by severe austerities and penances, or to those who consider the body the same. Purport by his divine grace. Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, is the son of Mother Yasoda, is very easily available for devotees, but not to tapasvis, yogis, and jnanis, and others who have a bodily concept of life. Although they may sometimes be called shanta bhaktas, real bhakti begins with dasyaras. Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Ye Yatamam Prabhajante Tantadaya Vajahamiham Mama Vartmanu Vartmante Manusha Partha Sarvasya. As living entities surrender unto me, I reward them accordingly. Everyone follows my path in all respects. Oh, son of Krishna. So here, here's the, before we get to the main point that, that I want to discuss, this is another point. How are, how are the rasas? Shanta dasya sakya vatsavya madhurya. Is that fine, right? Shanta dasya sakya vatsavya madhurya. These are five rasas. Well, here it is said that, that shanta bhaktas, a shanta bhakta means a devotee in shanta ras. This is not real bhakta. This is not real bhakta. So, what is the rasa? of the Jumuna River. What is the rasa of Govardhan Hill? What is the rasa of the trees? What is the rasa of the cows and peacocks? And all those types of things which are everywhere in the brudge and which actually make up so much of the brudge, the earth, the brudge itself. What is that? That is all Shantaras. Shantaras section. Krishna's flute is Shantara's section. Krishna's buffalo horn is Kundal's. All these things, this is Shantara's section. Then again, the Shanta Bhaktas have no real bhakti. So how to balance that? So when it is said that Shantara's is not a ras, that is the Shantara's of the yogis who have a complete neutral position. They are in complete neutrality. There isn't a drop of seva in them towards the Supreme Lord. They're just in some plane of consciousness realizing the super soul. Those are actually the Shantaras bhaktas who realize the super soul. Those super soul bhaktas, you know where they go when they give up the body? Like what the super soul means? Chapter mm. Buj Narayan, forearm form Narayan. But they don't go to my because Vaikuntha necessitates service also. They go to the Brahma, Brahma Jyoti. Even those who have seen forearm, form of Lord Vishnu in their heart. Without Dasya, one cannot go into the Vaikuntha. 
Or to speak of the upper side of my kumpa into the global kumpa. So, all through Vaikuntha and all through Goloka Vrindavan, the primary rasa is dasya rasa. That is the foundation. There are shanta dasyas, sakya dasyas, patsaya dasyas, and madhurya dasyas. All are servitor there, serving in neutrality, friendship, parental, and uh, unconjugal, conjugal love. Govardhan Hill is Shanta Bhakti. This uh, Madhavinda Puri a Shanta Bhakti. He was a Kalpa Vriksha tree from their God. And he came, that tree had four types of fruits Madhurya, Vatsavi, Sakya, and Dasya. This is some description as he and actually, it is from him that our sampradaya begins. It's not written very much because it's too esoteric a point. Generally, we trace back to Brahma, Madhva, and we go back. But actually, you trace back to Madhavanapuri, that's where our sampradaya begins. That's where the Madhurya ras, the seed for Madhurya, began. It manifested with the appearance of Madhavinda Puri through his words. Srimati Radharani spoke through him directly, directly spoke through him, giving the seed of the Madhurya Ras. So actually, internally, you trace our Sampradaya back to Madhavinda Puri. That is actually our Sampradaya. And everything else is for accommodation. Because the Vedic thinkers, the Vedic followers, and all these people, they have a difficult time to progress, to accept uh, this uh, the, 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 the dynamic arrangements. So, Shantaras, even Shantaras, it, it, it is so exalted. Nothing is of the ordinary type in Vrindavan. Nothing is ordinary about Krishna. Nothing is ordinary about Krishna's pastimes. Everything is par excellent, Su superb, superlative. So when it says here that Shanta Bhakti is, uh, that's not real bhakti. Real bhakti begins with dasya. You, know, you understand the situation. So. Then everyone is seeking for Krishna, for he is the super soul of all individuals. Everyone loves his body and wants to protect it because he is within the body as a soul. And everyone loves the soul because the soul is part and parcel of Krishna. As the Lord says in Bhagavad Gita, Veda es cha savayera hamme vedya. By all the Vedas, it is I who am to be known. Therefore, the karmis, the jnanis, the yogis, and saintly persons are all seeking after Krishna. But by following in the footsteps of the devotees who are in direct relation to Krishna, with Krishna, especially the inhabitants of Vrindavan, by this method one can reach the Krishna. Although the Nitya Siddha expansions of Krishna always remain with Krishna, if those engaged in sadhana siddhi follow in the footsteps of Krishna's Nitya Siddha associates, such sadhana siddhas also can easily attain Krishna. So, uh, this is a given rule. We must follow in the mood of the residents of Vrindavan in our bhajan life. Where does that begin? What does that actually mean? The Sahajiya section is prone to just that. Sahajiism, which means imitation. Mm -hmm. They try to imitate the mood of any particular resident of Vrindavan, particularly the gopis, but they may also be found to imitate Mother Yasoda and Madhavaraj, their mood. Uh, but following in their footsteps, there is one mood that is generic 
amongst all the residents of Vrindavan. And that is selflessness. They are selflessness personified. What's the time? They are selflessness personified. So to take up the mood of any particular resident of Vrindavan, that won't even be our question or issue, whether it's Manjari, Shaki, Vatsalya, one thing is required, and that is selflessness. How to become selfless without any selfish desire, without any selfish intention, that is required. And when we approach that, we'll say, we'll find that. Well, that is not so easily achieved. That is just not a one step, and that's done. And now I'm ready for step two. That being taken itself, the better part of our lifetime, to actually come to the state selflessness. Because without that, no one can intervene. No one can serve there. No one can add anything to that plane. No selfishness has a place there at all. It is the most extreme disqualification, selfishness. So we are followers of the gopis, no doubt, and the brajabhasas. The first step should be see their selfishness. You're going? No, 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 I'm sorry, my legs are. Oh, that's okay. My legs are the same. <laughs> we take a break. Right. Oh, please stop that. Huh? Yeah, no, please stop that. <laughs> um, selflessness. Mm -hmm. To the extreme degree, to the extreme degree, you are his slave. You are his slave. And that just, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I don't mind working a little overtime. I don't mind doing a marathon. But, you know, and then we just leave it on his servant. The slavery just like shivers in the body. Slavery is such a powerful word. It is so alien. It's so undesirable. Slavery. Slavery is the highest freedom. Divine slavery will give us all the freedom and more than we could imagine our so-called struggle for independence. And uh, Prabhu and I were talking the other day that to help us achieve that, the mud life is established. The authority. Yeah, we're going to do something. We take permission from our Guru Dave. Oh, our Guru Dave is not available for that. Then his representative is there in the form of mud commander, his acharya, temple president, whatever. There's some system. Hmm? We should go in that system. Hmm? And uh, that is to help us enter into the life of slavery. Independence is our single biggest enemy. It is the cause of all our misfortune. How to give that up? Because in this world, as soon as we give it up, we're exploited. We're cheated. So we don't want to give up our independence on that side. And at the same time, oh, if I give me independence, how can I enjoy it? So I need my independence. If we think it is good, we'll be independent, we won't be cheated. But we ourselves are the cheater. And we are cheated. Independence. Independence of the Supreme Lord. So mutt life means to enter into a bubble of Vaikuntha and to practice a life just as if you were no longer in this world, you were in that eternal world where everything was divine loving grace above your head, where nothing was to be feared. There you don't need your independence. You don't have to struggle for existence. You can accept everything as grace upon your head. So what life is actually meant for that? Servant of the servant of the servant. Everyone becomes servant. Das, 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 and das. Giving up independence. Doing everything for Krishna's satisfaction. We are his property. And the amazing thing is, it's true. We are his property. Just like I have on my desk a wristwatch and a pocket watch. Relatively speaking, that's my property. If I want to wear the watch one day, I wear it. If I want to pocket the watch the next day, I pocket it. That's my property. If I want to set it here, it stays there. It has no independence. It is an object. We are simply objects. Jivas are objects of the Supreme Lord's pleasure. So 
because you have to this is a hard lump to swallow. But people just don't want to fess up to the truth. He's an autocrat, he's the supreme joyer, we are objects for his play. But those who have accepted that, they are living in eternal happiness. Still we hesitate to cross that line, but the mutt life is to help us cross that line. The mutt life is not the place to run the secular type of existence of our independent and so many things from outside. And then it comes in conflict. Not everyone may live in the mutt. Those who don't live in the mutt, they should live outside and serve the mutt. I think in one chapter in the Art of Sutton it's called the Necessity of the Mutt. It's part of the chapter. The necessity. To execute the life in Krishna consciousness, there must be a mutt. And if not a mutt, there must be a connection to a mutt and serve the mutt. Because the mutt is the Vaikuntha. It is where the ideology is in play. So nowadays, in the mutts, especially in the Western world, so much mundane consideration is coming. Everyone clamors for independence. Everyone clamors for respectability. Even the women, I've been told, they don't want to be called Prabhu anymore. No, no, they don't want to be called Matajis. They want to be called Prabhus. And there's struggle for freedom against much repression. <laughs> Prabhu. How we want to be called Prabhu? Prabhu means master. Just see. I want to be called master. Why am I not called master? It's so funny, when, when we first take sannyas, we're in a society. Therefore, there's so many social things. So in the West, sannyas is called Maharaj. So every once in a while, they call him Prabhu. But uh, new sannyasis, they frequently become irritated by this. And uh, you should call me Maharaj. They'll say like that. You should call me Maharaj. It's true, we're supposed to call the sannyasi Maharaj. But we call Sri Nityananda Prabhu. Nityananda Prabhu. In Vrindavan, we call Krishna Prabhu. Hey Prabhu. People come in front of the deity, they tell, Hey Prabhu. Hey Bhagavan. Hey Prabhu. Prabhu means master. Nityananda he is Prabhu. Advaita Acharya, he is also Prabhu. But if we, we slip and call a sannyasi Prabhu, then yeah, what is this? I must be called Maharaja. Prabhu. So, sometimes like that, but really, we do not want to be called Prabhu. But we have to live with that. When you write a letter, do you sign Govardhan Prabhu? As I mentioned this this morning. No, Das. We sign as Das. So, the sannyasis there are supposed to sign as Swami. They may also sign as Das. Sarasatha Thakur used to sign uh, Kim, uh, Kim Kar Das, something like that. Humble servant of the Vaishnava. And then he was Sarasatha. He also signed as a Das. If his disciples gave Pranams, he would return and give Pranams. Oh, the disciples find this very difficult thing to live with. Nonetheless, they'll have to adjust. But he will not give that up except for on certain occasions. He may also say Prabhu. They'll have to live with that. The Guru may address his disciples as Prabhu. But we have seen, not only address them as Prabhu, he may ask for blessings also. How many times we went to see for the Pori Maharaj with the group, our group from our mud, and Brahman Dwayne Maharaj and others, and some devotees, and one group would go in for his darshan, and what he would tell Please bless me. You've seen this? Many times. So a very awkward position for us. Unless there's some fool amongst us that's thinking, well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Since you're asking. <laughs> like the, the, the Brahmins, sometimes they may feel, oh, this is me. I am Brahmin, of course. You know, so. Maybe they'll think like that. People think that way about Raghunathas right Vishwam, historically. We can bless Raghunathas. 
written. Because Raghunath Das Goswami, he has asked for the blessing of the Brajabhasi. So sometimes those Brajabhasi types, oh, you can give to Das Goswami. I am Brajabhasi, I will give a blessing. But this is intolerable. His mood, he is praying like that. He is the Brajabhasi. Das Goswami. And the Brajabhasi is born in this world. They don't compare to his standard, Brajabhasi. So, um, and these are not just words. Oh, the group has come for darshan. Here's a catchy thing to say. Please give me your blessings. It's not like that at all. It is not a game. The Vaishnavas are not playing a game. It is their heart, though. One time, someone was telling me, Madhavaraj's father was telling me, here's an association of one of my godbrothers in Hawaii. And he was saying, he's so heavy. He's so heavy. He made so-and-so cry. He's so heavy. He made so-and-so cry. He's so heavy. He was talking about how heavy he is. How heavy he is. So. How heavy when he got it? Yeah, with another devotee. He made him cry. He made Sadhana cry. He made this one cry. He made that. He's oh. so heavy. He made him cry. And I said, yeah. I said, yeah, you can just imagine. <laughs> I said, I said, and I said, you know, I said. And what it was is this, this Madhavara's stepmother was in the middle. He was pulling one side towards that camp, and I was pulling on this side towards the pharaoh. So he was trying to tell how heavy uh, this godbrother, this preacher, this guru, so heavy, he's made big men cry and break down. I said, I said, yeah, I said, I have seen, I said, Sridhar Maharaj, he's so heavy, just looking at him makes you cry. <laughs> and Bhakti is the name. She was captured. She became a disciple of Sridhar Maharaj. And Venanath, he was a little stunned by that, too. He was like, what do you say? He is so heavy just by looking at him. You feel the air condition. So... <clears throat> Questions? Krishna and Vrindavan? I had one or two questions from you on that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> How about Krishna's? I, I don't remember the question, but it was about his original. The original Krishna not leaving Vrindavan. Mm. Well, yeah, there wasn't much of a question there. It just seems like from what you're describing that um, a certain intimacy of Krishna's will is actually hidden. Mm. Bhagavatam. By some design. Yes, the, because Bhagavatam. Um, Careful how you would actually say this. I've said this before, and some senior devotee of personalities told, no, no, not like that. Everything is there in Bhagavatam. So we say everything is there in Bhagavatam. But actually, just yesterday, I heard Sri Sriyarama say, the Bhagavatam is only pointing the direction. Just, it's this way. So many things he's not told there in the assembly. He's not directly mentioned Radharani, he's not told any of these things. Later in the works of the Goswamis, all these things are given policy. Not even in the time of Bhagavatam. So, <clears throat> yes. Uh, oh, this morning we were discussing how the first deities were installed after Krishna's death, the Vrindavan pastimes and everything. Then uh, King Jamanjaya, he appointed the uh, Brajanath, you know Brajanath? Brajanath, Krishna had 16,000 wives. Queens in Dwarka, Swakiras, in each home, ten sons, each son married, and ten children each, something like that. So one of these grandchildren of Krishna married, and his wife was away at the family residence, giving to give birth to the child, that's the Indian tradition. 
at the time the Yandus self-destruct and all were gone. But this one queen, queen means a wife of one of the grandchildren of Krishna at Dwarka, Krini. And her child is born, one male child. He became known as Brajnath. And King Janman Jaya, who is the son of Maharaj Parikshit, he appointed Brajanath the king of Mathura. And the king of Mathura then established all the original deities of Vrindavan, Rabinaji, Gopinath, Mother Mohan, uh, Bunky Vihari, the deities of Minnesota and Nanda, and, and, and Nandagram, the Gopal, the lifter of Govardhan, who later appeared to Madhavinda Puri, and four Shiva Lingas, uh, Chakdeeswar, Gopeshwar Mahadev, two others, Daoji and Goku. He established all these deities and all these temples originally. You know the hill Madan Mohan is built on? If you ever look down the side, you see all these bricks sticking out of it? It's a very peculiar hill. It's a mound which has increased over the centuries. And uh, maybe 20 years back, more 25, maybe 30 years back, Somebody got down at the base and pulled a brick out of the base of that hill. You see all these little rubble and brick. Pulled a brick, like pulled out a brick, and it has an inscription that this was the temple of Mother Mohan 5,000 years ago. And Mother Mohan deity was first established by Bhajanam, who was on the temple there. Later destroyed, the deity was moved. And later, Vaitacharya came, and he was manifested Vaitacharya. And, and later, Sanatana Goswami came, he was serving the deity. The deity was taken up onto the hill and, and modern that temple. Again, that temple destroyed down at the bottom of the hill, another temple. Brudge has a long history. So all these original deities established by Brajanath. And at that time, it's no Radharani. No Radharani was established there. So not only Krishna, in certain aspects of his Leela, but the most profound aspects of his Leela, not revealed at that time. Not revealed until the time of Mahalavu and six Goswamis. And through them, all was revealed. And Janavi Devi played an important role in that. <clears throat> and I know in instance, for example, Govindaji, when Govindaji was revealed, uh, on the hill, that's the yoga pit of Vrindavan, where the Vinaji temple is. And he was, have you ever been down in the hole where he was, in the ground? No. You can go under, down, inside. Maybe I think we all went together once with your Guru Maharaj, were you on that trip? But there's a stairs that go down, there's a chamber, mm -hmm. there's a deity of yoga Maya. And quite far under the ground, that was the chamber where the window was hid and covered over with dirt. Everybody ran away from the the hordes of Turks, which were invading. Then the deity remained there for centuries. And then again, and the cows used to come and give milk from their udder on the ground, three or four cows, and soaking the ground. And the village men, they, they noticed this, and they went to Rupa Goswami and told him, this phenomena, every day, the cows, they come and they ooze milk on the ground. So then Rupa Goswami came and he saw that. He gave some thought about that. Then in the night when he slept, he had a dream. He could see the Lord beneath in the ground, requesting, please, excavate me. So he went there, and they dug, and they go so far down, and they hit the big stone slabs, double and triple layer, those big things. Removing them, they came right in onto the roof. There was a So when he was revealed in that way, the word spread all over Braj, huge big festival and everything. Prior to that, there was Gopal revealed to Madhavinda Puri. One year on a Kup festival was held. One year. Govardhan Puja type festival went on every day for one year. 365 days. Madhavinda Puri conducted the festival. And at that time, Madhavinda Puri, who was a sannyasi and not a Brajabasi, he initiated all the people of Anayur, the village of Anayur. He initiated Brahmins, non-Brahmins. This is a big reference in Chaitanya Charitamrita about 
what Sarasota Flat Board did was pass an initiating, initiating non Brahmins, initiating Brahmins, he's a non Brahmin. And that was all done by Madhavin Report. He's mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita. So I like that. <coughs> um, Govindaji was worshipped, and one king was in Jaipur. And that king's name was Mon Singh. Mon Singh was king of Jaipur, and he was also the commander-in-chief of <coughs> Akbar's armies. And if you ever look at a political map, Akbar had one of the biggest armies known to the world, particularly relative to the size of the world in its time. He ranks right up there with Hitler, America, you know, Genghis Khan, and whatever. He was one of the most powerful people ever on the face of the earth. He ranks right up there with Rome. Area, which is bigger than Rome, the Roman Empire. And his commander in chief was this Mon Singh. And Mon Singh, when he heard that Govindaji as manifested again at Rindava, he came and he offered service. Uh, and that way he's considered a disciple of Rupa Goswami, of that type, Kshatriya. And uh, he financed the building of that Govindaji temple. And the architects were doing that. They also came. So originally, only Govindaji was in that temple. Then, sometime later, later on, and exactly I don't know the time, but um, oh, in all these stories, sometimes there's a mistake of the person and the time. Janabi Devi, the wife of Sri Nityananda Prabhu, she had a dream. And in the dream, she saw in Jagannath Temple, there's one shrine. And there's one goddess there. There are many little, little shrines inside the Jagannath Temple. Many deities and many types and goddesses and gods and goddesses and so forth. Uh, demigods. So she had a dream and this deity appeared and told, here in Jagannath Temple, uh, I'm worshipped uh, as, a, as a deity. Uh, but actually I am Radharani. I am Radharani. And please take me to be by the side of Vrinda and Vrinda. So then Janavi Devi, with her influence, they got out this Devi in the temple and they took up to the Ganges and then put on a boat and a boat all the way up to Lahabad on the Ganga and then veering left and going up to Jamuna and they came all the way to Vrindavan with the deity. And that is why, if you look at the deity of Radha Govinda, Original Radha Govinda, who are now in Jaipur, Radharani is only half the size. Only half. Half the size of Govinda. So, like that, such things are not necessary. Height and all these things, these are secondary. The Lord Himself appeared, and later Radharani herself appeared. But you can look, and you'll, you'll notice, oh, yeah, look, Radharani is only about this tall to Krishna, and that's why when she's elevated on the platform, Way less than half the height of Krishna. So the first deity was there at the side of Govinda, manifesting from Jagannath. And then after that, oh, something was one arrangement was one. Three Radharanis were being sent. One story was there. Three Radharanis were being sent. One was to be with uh, Mother Mohan. And two others were designated somewhere in Braj to be with the deity of Krishna. So the same arrangement, they came. The deities are where these three came from, I'm not sure, but they came to Vrindavan by boat, up in Congo, and everything. Then when they arrived, then the servants of Mother Mohan, they had a dream that. Radharani is come, no doubt. But other two are Lalita Vishanta, not Radharani. So then that Radharani joined the side of Mother Mohan with Lalita Vishanta there in the village of Kuroki. So like this, the consorts and the shakis, the associates of Radharani, they appeared only in the time of the Goswamis and shortly thereafter. And the conception was brought by them and at a point only 
Some of the deities remained in their singular form. Gopal, the lifter of Govardhan Hill, and actually he'd been taken away. And uh, Radharaman, who had re manifested to Gopalbhata Goswami. So they decided at Radharaman there must be Radharani by the side. So they made an arrangement and moved out, and they installed for deity of Radharaman by the side. So then, one day when the Pujaris opened the door for the Mangalarti, the Radharani was gone. It vanished from the altar by the side of Radharani. That's why they have that dress in this place by Radharani. They tell us Radharani, but only they had the dress of Radharani with the Mukut. So then from that day on, they placed the dress. And they searched high and low looking, where is the treachery, who is the thief, no thief. No one can enter such a tight, secure, nothing can impede here, no, 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 nothing can enter. So then they concluded by man, man means anger. In her man, Radharani has become angry, and she has left. When she wishes, she'll come back. So then, some time later, like more than a year later, the news came from near Delhi that a Devi has been found in a well. A Devi. And so the temple was being built. And so the Radharaman Goswamis, they felt some like mm, Devi in a well. Let us go for that function and let us see that day. So they went there for that function and they saw this is, this is Radharani. This is the Radharani who was by the side of Radharani. But they knew no one stole. No one stole. So they didn't dare to take her back. Either. So she was established there as a village goddess. So from then till now, the people of that temple, you know, they're all households. When they go for this hair cutting ceremony of the children called Nandan Sanskara, they go to that place. It's very near Delhi. And they have some special worship to do there. So, um, Radharani came to Govinda, Madan Mohan, like that. Then deities were installed, like uh, Radha Damodar and uh, Radha Shamasana. Radha is there in the beginning. But with Mother and with some of them, Radharani wasn't there. Then when they tried to bring Radharani, then she went away. So from then on, like that, Radharani was told us Radharani. But practically speaking, we don't see Radha. Then they also have their own ontology there. They say, actually, Radharani is Mahabharata. Radharani is combined. Krishna is never without Radharani. So Radharani must be there. So if she can't be seen, then she must be within. Originally the absolute truth <coughs> is one. It has become two. But we see that only one is there. So that who is that one? When the two become one again, that is Mahaprabhu. So inside Radharaman temple, they worship Radharaman as Mahaprabhu. They can see him as Mahaprabhu, Radha Krishna combined. Like that. So, <clears throat> very true. The pastimes of Krishna are not fully disclosed even in the ancient time of the Bhagavatam and Nandi Saranya. Only in the time after after that, the six Goswamis and then so many the confidential aspects of Krishna's pastimes in Vrindavan. They were disclosed uh, in the mood of service. And who are the higher servitors disclosed by the Goswamis. Uh, Otherwise, unknown. Unknown and unknown. And Narayan was favored. You know, Krishna is Janmastam, the deity is Narayan. There, the deity, you can still see the original deity, but it's not there in the building, the Janmastam. It's in the same neighborhood, about four blocks away. There's this little temple with one of the most gorgeous deities you've ever 
ever seen in your life. It's Vasudev Narayan, standing on the floor, uh, emblems of the Shamachandra, etc. It was about this big. When Mahaprabhu went <coughs> to the Janmastan where he danced and that's recorded, that's the deity that he saw. Later that temple was destroyed, the deity was hidden off and all this, and the remains where it is, and Marwaris had built this other big, big temple and you go there and it's sort of just like a carnival in there. Every god you can think of is that temple. Here and there. And the original idea is in the neighborhood, like four blocks away behind. So even after Krishna's appearance, he remained more or less unknown and unknown. The great mystery. Most conclude. He is an incarnation of the mind, of Vishnu. And none could understand the position of his consort, or the importance, the important position of his consort, such as Shri Then all this became known after the time of Mahaprabhu with his Jai Shri Janmasana Mahotsuru Ki Jai Shri Sarada Govinda Devi Ki Jai Shri Janmasana Dhamma Ki Jai Gopi Mahatma Om Vishnu Pakti Guru Varnam Shri Maharaj Ki Jai To pass the last 35 minutes before breaking fast with the japa It's not good to have a kid the neighbors, that's my enemies here. Okay. Is that all right? Sure. Unless you want to talk more? I have a question, Raj. Yes. Uh, you mentioned in your lecture and also in other lectures that uh, the, the exalted version of the same and you have to follow the uh, uh, bridge part of the Mm -hmm. If you want to follow it. And I always had this question what does it mean to follow in this place? It's too much authority to get an answer or no, no. what does it mean? There's <coughs> a real Braj Basi Vaishnava. There's a story how let me stress my leg. There's a story how one man he came by Mayapur, right? Then after that he crossed over to Navadri and he found that Gorka Shore Das Babaji's over there extremely extreme tiak. So he went there by his company. So when Babaji came to know that he'd come from Mayapur, he asked, oh, how, how, are Sar how is Saraswati? And then this man said, they are, they are, what is it called? Aishwari about. You know, they're the Vaikuntha. They're for this Vaikuntha opulence and grandeur and show. You know, they're not Ragamar. They're not line of Virgin Bhakti. And Gorakashura became furious. What do you know about Virgin Bhakti? Bhakti even on Thakur and Saraswati Thakur, they are directly descended. They are directly the men of Braj. And of course they are showing some Aishwarya in their preaching. They know how to serve Braj. Not you and so many other fools. And he told them and so many things straight in his tail. So they are thinking, what is, uh, most of the people are thinking, oh, Brajabhav, Brajabhav must be always so sweet, and must be great Tiag, and they have some, uh, just like, uh, I once thought in India, oh, I can become famous, there's no doubt about it, I can become famous in India, but I wouldn't want to live one day of that fame. You know how to become famous in India? Just become a big hypocrite. Become a big spiritual hypocrite. Just come up with some outrageous statement and just stick to it. Say it everywhere you go. After you've proven wrong 10,000 times, never admit it, stick with it. In 10 years, they'll be believing it. You have thousands of people flocking after you, making a birthday cake for you to walk through, throwing money at you, and building a big option. Yeah. Stand on one foot on the park or whatever you got us. Just keep standing there, and pretty soon you'll build a temple. You know where that guy is? The guy got nothing to say, don't know nothing, doesn't have any budget. He just stood there on one foot, leaning in a, leaning a, nice in a tree, job. you know, and people just come, boom. I have a story, there's a truck going down the road in India, it hits a boat, boom, and a 
rock falls out, right? Boom, lands on the side of the road. <laughs> Next thing, a guy is driving a rickshaw on a tongue to bite, he goes, and he spits pot, and it lands on the rock, right? And then the wind blows, and a, and a flower comes by and lands there. Come back 10 years later, you hear how Augustine Mooney establishes the lingo here, you know, 10,000 years ago. Just, mm -hmm. There are. What's the baby from the movies? Oh, uh, uh, Kuku, so Kuku. No. no, no, no. Santoshima. Santoshima. Yes. There <laughs> is no Santoshima. There is no Ayapa. And about 15 to 25 million people go to that temple every year. Ayapa. They do vows for one month. They chant incessantly. Shrami Ayapa, Shrami Ayapa, Shrami Ayapa, Shrami <laughs> they go and they go and they go and they go. There is no Ayapa. There's no Ayapa in the Vedas, the Puranas, or anywhere. And I just saw the other day, she was there is no Ayapa. <laughs> <laughs> it's all a concoction. <laughs> so you just make a concoction, you get your little peacock feather. You go like this and you just keep doing it. It doesn't have to be elaborate. Just some little little thing. Just be cheap. Very, very easy. Several times I've told people, all oh, the astrologers told me in previous life I was Mon Singh or Jai Singh. Astrologers will tell you whatever. And, 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 and it's just like, they did. They did. It's just like, I could just take that story and, you know, what we used to tell people? I was the Tipu Sultan. <laughs> and Suba and these this village <laughs> <laughs> you know, they just, yeah, yeah, let's go with that one, you know. And it's like, whack, give them a slap. That's just the symbol, the nature of the people. Just, they want to be cheated, they want some story. And that's, if you look at all the bogeys, they all got a story. They all got some ridiculous thing they do and say. And who is less popular? Those who are really preachers. They're less popular. Whether they're Madhus, Ramanus, or Hubs, people that stand for truth. Their particular plane of plane of truth. They're the least accepted. So the average people don't know who is a resident of Braj. They don't understand what is a real Brajavasi in the first place. So once we find a real Brajavasi, then to follow in his mood, as I said earlier, the first step is selflessness. That is his mood. They are selfless. They are not for any selfish and personally motivated cause. They are only for the cause of the Supreme Lord. They are only for the welfare of all other living beings. One nice thing when we presented the Gaiji Mandar to the people here in Burma, and it's a nice book, it's on a very elevated topic, on this reasonable controversy, that's all right, that shows that it is on a very elevated topic, no doubt. After all of that, for an hour, and we leave the room, we go back in the room, he's again looking at the book. He's sitting there rubbing the book. And then he's asking, something for the welfare of the people. The high topic. How can this not be of great interest? Not that book, particularly, but yes, that book. Commentaries of Bhakti Vinod, Vishwanath Chakrabarti Thakur, Shri Goswami Maharaj. How can these things not be of interest? Gayatri? Gayatri? such a central interest in the Guru Maharaj, so much appreciation of Gayatri. So, I think it must have, but what did it awaken? Not like, oh yes, and some other high topic, we need to have a book brought out on this and that. I, what I'm trying to say, the whole thing, the next thing that followed was a concern for the ordinary people. A book about Krishna, which can be understood by everyone he asked for two books. One about Krishna, one about Bhagavatam. Like life and precepts, small and understandable by everyone in the world. In one sense, that's not possible because there's so many different types of people in the world. But nonetheless, the idea was the compassion. Hmm? Broad, simple presentation. For what? For those who don't know about Krishna. Why? Because if one passes this human form of life and does not come to know or hear or understand something about Krishna that he has lost for an ungiven, determined length, I mean, unimaginable 
book um, time is lost in the lower species. So how important it is to hear Krishna, to hear something about Krishna. So those are the the, the trick the thing, oh the Braja Gopis, the Braja people, they're only for the Gopi Ras, they're only for the Gopi Ras. No. The Braja people, when they come to this world, they are also for the fallen conditioned souls. Their hearts weep for them. Their tear, their eyes shed tears for them. They are concerned about them. This is the quality. And so many of the so-called, you know, high devotees uh, that you find in Braj, eh, they are not concerned for preaching. They lack this great compassion for other people. You know this program, Food for Life, Discount Food for Life, Prashad Distribution? Of course, Prashad Distribution has always been there in every temple, even in the Hindu temple. Prashad is everywhere. You know, it's not Prashad, they have Prashad. The Sikhs have what they call Langar. It's like the equivalent of Prashad. It's this mercy, food, feed. Yeah, that's a given. Right? But how Iskand, our Guru Maharaj's movement, became so much like involved Prashad distribution comes from one incident. Always just to get Prashad. But the idea that that they would give you know, on such a grand scale, you know, as was organized with the Prashad on Hall and the uh, Prashad distribution in Mayapur initially 20 years back and all that, it came from one incident. I'm sure Prabhupada walked to the end of, end of his veranda and down below was the kitchen and out back was the leaf pile, you know, where the prasad leaves are thrown. Sri Prabhupada walked to the end of his veranda and looked down and there were some Navadvip children from Mayapur crawling in the trash pile, licking the leaves, licking the leaves, eating out of our trash pile. And uh, this moved Sri Prabhupada to tears. Called his secretaries and servants. I told him, this is Atama. This cannot be. Not a single person should be hungry. We must destroy the Prashad. And that's what started their big campaign. You know, where you see the thousands, thousands of people every week. And it cost. I mean, they've spent a million bucks and more just on Prashad distribution over the years. It came from that. Intolerable. So, how to find the residents of Brudge? They have such compassion and love for the other living entities. This must be seen. They are selfless. They are not for themselves. And how to serve them? Ask them. Okay. Don't speculate. Find one, ask them, what can I do to serve you? Or if that opportunity is not there, don't think, hey, you know, I'm the only person that's figured this out. Just look, the line of service is going on. You don't even have to ask. A lot of people want, they just want to feel that they ask, Guru Maharaj, how can I serve you? And of course, that's not a bad thing. But maybe that opportunity is not there. Well, don't think that the line of service isn't going on because you haven't asked yet. It's going on. Get in the line. See who are, who are serving. Offer some service. When in doubt, when in doubt, ask um, what I look for is well, a number of things, but as far as Harikatha is concerned, I don't look to see how much the Leela of Krishna is being discussed. <coughs> That's not the key for me. I look to see how deep the discussion is even over the simplest point of Krishna consciousness. How deep the dis discussion will go. Where I see that going on, then I know this is where this is where I want to put my ear. Put my ear here. That so many pastimes of Krishna are always being discussed. But I'm really not that interested. And I found out that neither are a lot of senior devotees. Shri Ramara recently said, he said, Krishna Leela, that's a dreaming thing. That is not even for this life. That is a dreamy thing. That is not even real. What reality you'll find of Krishna killing demons here? 
what reality you can find about any of these things here, practically speaking. How do, where is the reality of that? It's all in the Saru Shakti. But Gorlila came right to your door. Nityananda Guru came right to your door and knocked on your door. And their representatives are still sitting in the chair. They've come to our door and they're still sitting in front of us and they're still speaking. So which thing will be most interesting? We're not against Krishna's pastimes, but the reality is there's not that much for us in this present life in that plane. And in Gaur Lila, the Acharya Lila. People go to Vrindavan for various reasons. The pastimes of Krishna, I speak personally, that's secondary. I go to Vrindavan for the Samadhi of Rupa Goswami, the Samadhi of Sanatana Goswami, the Bhajan Tukutir, my Guru Maharaj, the places of the Acharyas. You go around, oh, Krishna killed a demon here. Oh, Krishna stole a bangle here. He does all these things. He will, he will, he will, he will. But when you come to the place, oh, here's where Kadam, Tara Kadambi, here's where Rupa Goswami wrote the Bhakti Rasa Veda Sindhu. Now, this is a place you want to pay attention to. More so. That realm of Vrindavan for us is more meditation. Where these acharyas perform their bhajan life, where they perform various things. More important for us than where um, Krishna's pastimes. In a sense, understand it? just a particular angle of vision, see, that's more important for us. Just like there was that evening. The Brajmandal Parakram, our Guru Maharaj and others were there, many were there. They made an announcement. Tonight the Parakram will go to Seishai Vishnu Temple. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Uh, Saraswati Thakur is going to give speech. Whoever would like to stay back and listen, they may stay back. Otherwise, the group is going. The group, the general group, you know, nine out of ten, they went to the uh, Seishai Vishnu Temple in Koshi. And our Guru Maharaj said, I thought, what I'll see there. One deity, one place of pastime. Here is Guru Maharaj speaking. How much opportunity I have for that? This place has been here 5,000 years. Guru Maharaj, no temple. So he stayed. And Sri Maharaj also told us that story. He said, yes, I remember that night. I also stayed. Many stayed. Many stayed. Some of the devotees, they may have gone because they had to take the pilgrims. That doesn't mean, oh, see, fools went from the darshan. But a certain intelligence says, oh, this, this is better. And actually, that's true. It is better. Nam Bhajan and Vaishnav Seva is superior to the uh, Archon Lord. And uh, this Ambarish, story of Ambarish, this exemplifies the position of the Vaishnav. It's one of the great things that it does. The position held by the Vaishnava is so great. Uh, if we get chance to actually serve the Vaishnava, that can bring us unimaginable good fortune. So, yeah, and not so hard to identify. But everyone will say, yes, we've identified. Sai Baba, we identified. <laughs> Amrita Ma, oh, we identified. You know? This one, that one, we identified. We all think they've identified. This is the phenomena of the material world. So much cheating going on. And given the inspiration to live in the fool's paradise. <laughs> this point, we were discussing who is a follower of Sri Sri Ramana. There's some debate going on. Who is in the line of Sri Sri Ramana? And uh, one devotee mentioned this puja la raga patagora vabhangye, right? Mm -hmm. But they didn't mention that it's written on the gate of Sri Ramaraj's ashram. It's arched right above in Bengal. The puja la raga patagora vabhangye. It's there. Entering that land, entering there, this is the mandate. Mm -hmm. This is the, the move. This is the standard. 
if we're going to follow his line, and which is the line of Saraswati Thakur, which is the line of your Guru Maharaj, which is the line of my Guru Maharaj, and this is a mandate. This is the mandate of Saraswati Thakur. A little distant and below, we will hold the highest conception above our heads. And this necessitates and includes the service of the higher devotees. Not trying to be the higher devotees ourselves, but serving the higher devotees. And not trying to position ourselves there in the higher leela, coming back and giving regard for that. That's this whole color. This is a color, lower color. Higher color is white dress. Babaji, Paramahansa Vesh, white dress. Only we keep the bead bag white. So Tanya Guru Maharaj has a colored bead bag. This is all the doing to the disciples. But actually, the bead bag is white. The bhajan is of that quality. But to do good to the world, Saraswati Thakur put this uttar, this color here. Lower position. Parvajarkacharya. <coughs> then we told Parvajarkacharya and Paramahansa. Paramahansa Parvajarkacharya. Not just Parvajarkacharya. The lower position. Babaji dress, white dress, that's Paramahansa dress. Paramahansa dress. So, Gaudiya Mutt means to do the ultimate good, ultimate welfare for others. So, you would think by now that the line would be firmly established, yet there exists in the world so much doubt and confusion in so many quarters about what it means to be a follower and who it is we're following. Some section says, Prabhupada, Prabhupada Nugans started a new Sampradaya. When asked who's the head of the Sampradaya, Prabhupada. They'll say, Prabhupada, for the next 10,000 years, Prabhupada. So we say, well, when's that going to begin? <laughs> if this were the next 10,000 years, when's the first day going to begin? when these are the law books of human society. Or do you mean to say you're the only human? Because you follow those books. You know what they're saying? I mean, Guru Maharaj's books are law books for the yeah. next 10,000 years. So when's that going to begin? There's certainly not the law books now. So how, when, when is that going to begin? And as Narayan Maharaj said once, what books did he write anyway? I don't think he wrote any books. No, he did. Chaitanya Charts and Ritans. He didn't write the Chaitanya Charts and Ritans. Kavi Rashi Bhagavatam, that's written by Vyas. Nectar Devotion, that's written by Rupa Goswami. What are you talking about when you say Prabhupada's books? Somebody said, easy journey to other planets? <laughs> <laughs> he said, no, he said, no, 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 he said that's easy journey to other planets? <laughs> he didn't write that either. Krishna wrote that for him. <laughs> it's pretty good, he gave him the lesson. Huh? He said that. What? He said that anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> so Prabhupada used to read his own books. Yeah. And say, I didn't write these books. Krishna did. So I used to try to tell my god brothers, you know that you know that story, you know that mood? And then he said, All right, then I mean, now you read this book. Sri Ramaraj didn't write this. Mahaprabhu did. I believe. I believe. But really, transcendental literature must be backed by something. And not just the doing of the man. If it's really transcendental now, eh, every year it's like, remember the last time we were in Mayapur? Last time we went to Vrindavan? All the books came. So many books came. Garbage, garbage. There was two books out of like the six new books that came out, which had some semblance of value. Remember that? There were some books that were like, hey, you didn't know where to put them. They were so useless. And uh, they were full of misconception, all kinds of things. It's like, where do you put this thing? I didn't know if to throw it up, throw it down, so I'll just leave it there and leave it alone. No, everybody has a book. Everybody has a book. That's become a thing. Write a book. And as for after one book, then what's your next book, Prabhu? There's this ongoing thing, write a book, write a book, write a book. But books are not supposed to be like that. It's like our, like Ramar said, 
voted to, to bring out the works of the previous insurers, particularly the part of faults or others. Some persons are qualified. They bring out a book. It has a value. It has a value in the preaching field. That's one field. It has a value in the devotee field. That's a yet a different field, a different type of preaching. Right? And then there are those books that come out. They have a value in one field. It's somebody's mental speculation and misconception. We have no value for them, no regard for those books. We don't allow them in our books. We don't allow our students to read them. They are bad. Books should be in the line, they should be in the proper line of conception. What your Guru Maharaj told, Gayatri, a book is on Gayatri? There should not be any misconception here, no fancy creation of your own, all these things. There was some concern. What is this? How is this? That shouldn't be the same. I saw a book this year on, what was it on? Shiksha Guru. It was page after page after society consciousness. What I'm understand about that whole Gayatri thing, there already was a book on Gayatri that came out nine months before yours did. I know, yeah. and there have been dozens <laughs> before, that, before that, before <laughs> that, and before that. Well, there's a certain problem in that. Because I was the one that brought out this publication not somebody else who they think should be the giver. It has a, little, it has a lot of personal ego involved. Anyway, um, yeah, so how to recognize the, uh, the line, mm -hmm. the character, all in the line may not be of the same character. That's all awesome. All those who are of the right character they may also not be the same. We're seeing in our life, in our, our life, say us, the holy devotees, we're seeing, seeing three prominent devotees, Sarasota Prabhupada's disciples. We did not see all. We have come to know now there were many, but we have seen three. My Guru Maharaj, Sri Sridhar Maharaj, Sri Maharaj. Three we have seen. All others uh, we did not see. And others, Balatirtha Maharaj, Narayan Maharaj, well, they are disciples of their disciples. That's another generation. That is not the upper generation. The upper generation, uh, who are your param gurus. You may take shiksha guru or whatever, that's another thing. You may also leave that tomorrow. That's another thing. You cannot leave Guru Varga is above you. Sarasati Thakur and his disciples. You understand? Then one line comes after that. Sridhar Maharaj, my Guru Maharaj, Srila Pori Maharaj, they're distinctly three different personalities. There's no, there's no comparison personality-wise. What did Srila Pori Maharaj tell about Siddhanta? My Siddhanta and Sri Maharaj's Siddhanta are one, non-different. What he told, who doesn't accept Srila Sri Maharaj's Siddhanta? He is not a follower of Saraswati Thakur. So with Siddhanta, there is a there is things there. Correct, Siddhanta. The delivery may be different. So much different. Did you see that paper somewhere where he said that? No. It doesn't really do that. I was speaking to the Tribhari Mars the other day and I said, Maharaj, I said, we thought we had seen it all in Prabhupada. Then Krishna just amazed us what we saw in Srila Guru Mars. And I said, remember Ten years ago, or eight, nine years ago, I asked you, I said, do you think we'll ever encounter anything similar to this again? Two such personalities in our life? And Maharaj and I, back, way back nine years ago, we said, no, I don't think you can, you can do better than two in a lifetime, you know? And I said, well, Maharaj, I said, I said, I, I have been there, and I have seen it in Srila Pori Maharaj, which you could not imagine. You could not imagine to see in Prabhupada. You would not see that. And you could not imagine to see that in Sri Sri And what is that? I said, I said, that is just, how do I describe it? I said, it's just like unleashed ecstasy. Just mm. shaking the body, voice trembling, just like, it's like a hurricane just <laughs> coming. It's just like, I said, and not the same. There's some difference in terms of the individual. I said, so we think at any stage, oh, I've seen it all. 
now the next oh I, now I have seen it all but always going to that you know okay that's it I've seen it all I know it all but uh, then they're different you can imagine I just couldn't imagine our guru Maharaj giving any time it's not possible it's just not possible yeah. <clears throat> Completely reserved. Then, say, to the Sridhar Maharaj, I told Maharaj, I said, Maharaj, you, we would see what? His extreme pensive mood. Just eyes would shut, head would tilt this way, head would go back, head would tilt this way, look out at the world like it wasn't even there, go back into his own thoughts. Then we never saw him shaking and shouting and all of this faltering voice, overwhelmed like that. We never saw. I said, well, we have seen him. So, <clears throat> if you're looking for the higher devotees, good luck. If you don't find them, keep looking. <laughs> <laughs>